Okay, everybody. Um, good morning to those in the United States and Canada. Good afternoon to those in the UK. Um, we are live with Fund My Past. Uh, wherever you are, thank you so much for joining us. Uh, we're always happy to have, um, have people on Facebook with us engaging and, and helping each other and participating in our community. Uh, we're hoping that everybody is uh, happy and healthy and staying at home and um, and everybody in your families and your loved ones, your friends are, um, are, are doing all right. Uh, my name is Jen Baldwin, and today we're going to be talking about exploring international news in UK newspapers, a topic that I'm particularly excited about. Um, I'm just going to watch. I'm watching the live count go up a little bit, so I know that we have people on with us. Um, so that's always fun. It's good to see. We've got about 10 people, it looks like, so far. Um, so I'm just going to give it a minute before we get started and before I get into the slides here, um, but we will get started shortly. Um, for those of you who don't know me, uh, I am actually um, part of the North American team for Find My Past. I'm the data acquisition manager here in North America, and I'll, I'll talk about that as well through the slides, but um, um, my passion is really exploring American history and, and the impact of the kind of the British Commonwealth, right, um, on on those of us over here on the North American continent. So um, part of my job is just finding new ways to use our British and Irish records, which are incredible, to help people in North America explore their British and Irish roots. And that's um, that's part of what I do. And it's part of um, part of my job that I actually really love. Um, all right. So it looks like we've got a few people on. Thank you all very much for joining. I hope that you can hear me OK and that everything's going fine. I don't see any comments just yet. So um, hopefully, um, hopefully that's all working all right. So we're going to go ahead and get started. Um, as you can see, I'm sharing slides um, today, but we also have the camera on, so that's fun. You get a little bit of, of everything today. And then after I'm done with the presentation portion of this, um, I will actually um, uh, do a live Q&A as well. Um, so we see Rosie is here, William is, uh, William Shore, thank you so much for being with us. Um, I always love seeing you, William. Ron from Roscoe, Illinois, that's uh, dreary in Roscoe, it sounds like, that's too bad, Ron. Um, I'm in Colorado, actually, where, uh, so you know where I'm located, I'm in the mountain time zone. Hopefully it's not too early. I see Sharon from California, it is eight o'clock your time, Sharon, thank you so much for being with us. Um, a part of uh, one of the joys of, of working for an international or UK-based company, right, for me. Um, and then just so everybody knows, we have Niall uh, watching from our Ireland office, uh, my colleague Niall. So he's going to be helping on the comments side today. Um, so thanks, Niall, for being with us. All right, so let's, um, let's get into this um, and, and jump into the presentation. Today, we're going to talk about exploring news in UK newspapers. And for me, this is, this is a really exciting opportunity to learn about a a huge um, a difference in perspective, right? Uh, how was American or Canadian news explored in the UK um, and vice versa, right? How was it reported on? Um, so I'm gonna just share a few of the things that I have been able to find. Um, and just a quick introduction again um, on myself. Um, I'm the data acquisition manager for North America. So I have a really great job. One of my favorite family history finds is the name of my fourth great grandfather actually in Birmingham newspapers in Birmingham, England. Um, that's uh, such a delight. Now it's a theory, right? It's a theory I'm trying to continue to work on. Um, but I will show you an example of that as we go through the slides today. Okay, so what is the British Newspaper Archive. Um, I'm going to refer to the British Newspaper Archive quite a bit in the next 30 minutes or so, um, but you can find the same newspapers actually on findmypast.com. If you have the ultimate package subscription, you have access uh, to these newspapers. The British Newspaper Archive is actually a secondary website, um, so it's a sister site to Find My Past. Uh, but it's a product that um, and a project that we're extremely proud of. It's the largest online collection of British and Irish historical newspapers that's available. We're digitizing newspapers from the collection at the British Library, which is one of the largest newspaper collections uh, in the world and certainly for the Western speaking world. Um, so while you can get these newspapers on both sites, find my past and britishnewspaperarchive.co.uk, um, both sites offer 
a little bit something different. Both sites offer um, different search functionalities and I actually use them in tandem with each other more than I use them individually. I use the tools that are offered on both sites to support my research. And I'll show you one of my favorite ways to do that as we progress. So for those of you who are new to the BNA, the British Newspaper Archive, um, this is the portion of, of the slides that I really want you to, to look at because there are some really great tools on the BNA website that allow those of us who are unfamiliar with um, UK geography uh, to, to really make a much more comprehensive and better search process. All right, so what kind of research are we talking about? Well, anything in newspapers that you would traditionally look for, whether it's your local paper or you know the place where your family was 100 years ago, you can absolutely do that same kind of research in international papers. Um, and there's, um, so there's a variety of ways that you can approach this, right? There are general history topics, um, world history, you know, anything that would have hit the newspapers in the United States um, or in Canada may have been picked up in international papers too. So one of my favorite examples of that is actually um, the um, assassination of Abraham Lincoln, right? That was presented um, uh, in multiple newspapers, obviously around the world. It was a huge, huge event, of course, for more than just America, right? It was a huge event internationally. And so that was covered in a variety of locations, right? Um, so looking for those kinds of big events is always something um, that I try to do, especially if that big event comes in the timeline of the ancestor that I'm interested in, right? Like I wanna know what was happening globally that affected the history of, of that particular person. Um, so that's, that's what I mean by international research and in a big sense, right, is understanding some of those big picture items, but also looking at significant um, locality specific events um, or military or war history, obviously big battles, you know, significant events in various wars would have been covered in a, in a variety of ways. I'll show you some example of those. We can also find genealogical events. We can find vital events like birth listings and obituaries. We can find information on passenger lists um, and vessels, not necessarily published lists of names, um, but other information to help us build the story of our ancestors. Certainly things like major weather events, right? Tornadoes and floods and hurricanes that, especially if it's unusual to the climate in the, in the newspaper, they might have told the story about that. And then celebrity events, social, social aspects, that kind of thing. So when it comes to your search strategy, you want to think about a variety of different things. Most of us are used to searching newspapers for the location in which our ancestors lived. And that's absolutely something that you should do. But you can also think about various keywords. What made that community special? What made it unique? Um, search for that element in international papers and see what you can find. Um, you can certainly search by date, by the title of the newspaper. Uh, if you happen to know where your ancestor was from, you know, the town of origin or the county or even the area, you can do that. Um, so I prefer to search by county before I search for any kind of town or any more specific location. Um, I utilize the advanced search tools a lot uh, to make sure that my custom search um, is actually um, getting across what I'm really genuinely looking for. And then I use the search by region tool on the British Newspaper Archive website a lot. Um, and this is the one that really helps me because I may not be familiar with that particular area of England or Ireland or wherever I'm looking. Um, and instead of examining a map for three days to figure out what towns existed, I can search by region. Um, so let me show you that. This is part of the British Newspaper Archive website. Um, and it's actually just on the homepage. If you go to britishnewspaperarchive.co.uk and you just scroll down, um, you'll find this. And it's just this little map is what I want to draw your attention to, just right in here. If you hover over one of those areas on the map, it will give you a region. And what it allows you to do then is search all the newspapers from that region. So in this case, I've chosen the West Midlands of England. Um, and I can search any of those time frames. I can see all the newspapers by title. If I filter by newspaper, I get a nice clean list of all the available titles, which I particularly enjoy because it gives me the ability to actually develop a search strategy based on those newspapers. I don't have to dig around anywhere to see what's available to me and what I'm actually supposed to be, what newspaper titles I'm supposed to be looking in, right? If I was 
um, looking in, in this area, I would not know off the top of my head to look in the Coventry Herald, right? But because of this search functionality, because of this list, I can go straight to the website and say, what area, what newspapers are available in the area it does all of the homework for me essentially so I can just get straight into my research. Um, so this is a very, very powerful tool for those of us who are again unfamiliar with the geography and maybe not as comfortable researching in a new area, this gives us kind of a, a preempted list of opportunities for research so it's a really great tool and one that gets overlooked so make sure that you are utilizing the search by region feature on, on the British Newspaper Archive website. All right, let's take a look at some of my favorite examples. There are thousands of examples that I could use for this session. Um, I had to I had to pick just a few, um, but let's start with some of the very basic stuff, right? Genealogy, important events, vital events, birth, marriage, and death. In this case, um, you're looking at um, uh, the Wishaw Press from 1925, and it mentions just a very simple birth announcement, right? From Chicago. So there is Mr. and Mrs. Neil Atkin. They had a daughter on the 31st of January of 1925. And it's just published just simply just like that. Um, on the other hand, you might get something like this. Now, this article is absolutely incredible. Incredible. It's from the Cornishman, 4th of May, 1939. So right on the eve of, of World War II, right? A Cornish death in Akron, Ohio. And it talks about this woman who um, was formerly of the Cornish area. And... Um, and it gives all this great information, right? Just in the first column, it's talking about her maiden name, uh, the details on the early marriage, right? Where they lived and, and how they occupied different locations and when they actually came to Ohio. It gives her birth date and location very specifically, April 21st, 1866. It talks about the funeral and the cemetery information. So that's helpful because uh, you can, you know, even if you don't know where she's buried yet, right, this article may tell you that information. And then that last paragraph in the first column is all family members with their relations, right? The husband, the daughter-in-law, the grandchildren, um, son and daughter-in-law. So it's just full of genealogical information, but that's not all, right? If you go to the second column, you have this giant list of people who participated or, or attended the funeral, and that is her fan club, right? Uh, for those of you who are familiar with fan research, friends, associates, and neighbors, it's really crucial type of research, especially for North American researchers. Um, and, and so that's a huge help, right? That's a big step in the right direction. It also lists some social context. It tells us that she was a member of the British American Progressive League of Akron, right? Which I didn't know existed, but now that you know about it, now that you know she was a member, you wanna to go to that organization and see if you can find records on her involvement and her participation in that. So, so that's a, you know, a, a huge win from a research perspective. And then it also talks about her spouse and her spouse's parents and how they um, uh, were infamously, right? Kept the one and all at Penzance. So, and that's the end of the article. It's like a tease, right? This is probably one of the best examples I've ever seen about um, talking about it, someone from an international location being published in a UK newspaper. It's absolutely an amazing article. So if you happen to be related to this person, lucky you. I wish I was. All right, a couple other examples though of just those vital events. So um, you know, pretty standard obituary that was published in the Aberdeen Press and Journal. And this individual was a teacher um, for quite a while, it sounds like, uh, before she married and immigrated to Canada. Um, and she happened to be on holiday in um, in Aberdeen when she, when she passed away. And so they, um, they not only had the death occur there um, when she was a resident of Canada, but um, but they published the obituary with with some familiar memories, her maiden name, um, you know, uh, information about her her family members and and so on. So another really great article that just um, uh, was published overseas. Um, another topic that we might be able to research in international newspapers is occupation, and I told you at the beginning that. Uh, one of my best finds was the name of my my great 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 grandfather um, in Birmingham, England, and I believe that this is the case. So let me tell you a little bit about this. So, in the background of this slide, you're seeing a, a document entitled Lawrence Evans. Um, it actually is a oral family history that's been passed down in my family um, for several generations now. It was written by um, Mary Houston, who is my great aunt, to but it was dictated by Francis Brown, who is actually the daughter of the person I'm looking for, John Horatio Lawrence. So in this document, it says, 
that John's father was a silversmith of the English middle class. It doesn't ever name his father. Uh, and it doesn't ever give us any other information other than that specifically to his father. So we know very little when we start this project, right? We know very little. We know that he was a silversmith and we are theorizing that he was somewhere in the Birmingham area um, because of the rest of the document. So I took this information and I said, well, what can I do with this, right? So one of the things I went, I did was to obviously look at city directories and electoral rolls and all of that. But I also looked at Birmingham newspapers. And what I found was awesome. So in the time period in question, um, according to all of these sources that I've been able to pull together, um, there is only one mention of a silversmith in the Birmingham area with the last name of Lawrence. Um, and this is one of these examples. So 8th of August, 1831 in Eris's Birmingham Gazette. Um, it actually talks about a patent that he designed um, that is of great importance to equestrians. And it's essentially, I actually have a copy of the patent file. It's essentially a seatbelt that goes underneath the, the horse's belly that attaches to the saddle to keep it all on and, and full intention. Um, but um, uh, the the newspapers was what really led me to continue the search, right? The newspapers is what put a, a, a contender for my fifth great grandfather in the right place in the right time with the right occupation. And so from this now, I know Mr. Lawrence's name. His first name was also John. Now I can continue my search in parish records and other kind of traditional sources so that I can see if this is actually correct, right? If I can prove the theory that this Mr. Lawrence Silversmith is actually my ancestor. Um, there are other mentions of him across the newspapers. And in this case, um, just a couple of years later, 1833, there is a mention that he is potentially being um, uh, going bankrupt. And so there's all this description about his property and, and so forth for the bankruptcy. Now, again, I don't know for sure if this is my John Lawrence, um, but there's a good theory, right, that in place because I was able to locate his name in newspapers, I can actually further identify and further research um, what, you know, all the traditional kind of possible sources. I didn't know his name or even had a guess of his name before these newspaper articles came, came to be. So what other topics can we look at? Military and war news. Obviously, this is one of the bigger categories, right? So um, any kind of um, uh, battles or engagements, the only, um, from a North American perspective, the only things that I haven't really been able to find a lot of is the American Revolutionary War. Now, there is some mention, um, and we'll look at that as one of our other examples, but um, not as much as other engagements, right? The War of 1812, all the world wars, uh, et cetera, um, are covered relatively um, thoroughly, even the American Civil War. So let's, let's take a look at some of these examples. Um, the Lancaster Gazette had a, a wonderful article about a trial of an American general um, from the War of 1812. And one of my favorite lines of this is that the trial has cost the United States from 50 to $100,000, right, with an exclamation point. Um, so you can start to get some of that early American history played out. And, and not just that the event happened, right? But the perception of that event in the UK, right? How did people see this? How did they engage with it? What did they think about it? Um, what did the newspaper editors or the art, you know, the, the author of the article actually think about what was going on, right? Was it nonsense? But obviously the emphasis here is on the cost of the case of the trial itself. Um, and, you know, eventually acquittal was approved. The court martial was dissolved by the president. It's, it's quite a saga, but, um, it's, uh, it's, it's quite fascinating to see what the perspective was from a Br British standpoint, right? Um, in the Liverpool Daily Post in September of 1863, we have this incredible story about an Englishman who was caught up by the Confederacy during the American Civil War. Um, and there are lots of examples like this, right? The American Civil War was huge news um, internationally. And, and so we really need to think about how we can learn more about that conflict, that engagement in these international papers. Um, and, and again, the perspective of how it was written about, right? What was the difference between the Union and the Confederacy in the eyes of the British people? Um, and so if you have ancestors who went back and forth during this time period, right? Think about if they were leaving the UK during the middle of the war, what they knew what they were walking into. Um, they, they 
theoretically had access to newspapers and to this information. And so what, what were they walking into and were they doing that willingly? And was that what swayed them from going, you know, to a Northern uh, affiliated state or a Southern affiliated state or, or, or moving West, right? Did they go to California instead um, and try their luck on the gold rush? It, maybe all of this kind of information in the newspapers swayed that, and, um, that decision-making process on their behalf. Of course, as we get into the world wars, again, um, a really prolific amount of writing, this particular piece caught my attention. Um, and I tried to duplicate this in other kind of localized newspapers and I wasn't able to locate it. So this is actually from March of 1947. It's a letter to the editor of this newspaper and the, the individual who's writing is um, a resident of Montreal, Canada. And his son enlists in, um, in, in the Canadian Army, and he was a member of the, what they called the Can Loan Scheme, which we actually um, talked about on our blog last week. Um, and he says that his son chose to participate in this um, because of their heritage. They, he knew, the son knew that the father and the grandfather were from this part of the UK. And so this father is writing this letter to the editor, and it's he's talking about his memories of the town where he grew up and, and, um, and things that were important to him and impactful to him and as to why his son enlisted in this particular unit during World War II. And that is something that you're probably not going to find in the local paper, right? You might, um, but this was a specifically letter to the editor of this town back in you know, their origin county and, and location. And that's a really special item because um, he's really talking about living memory at this point. Um, so it's just a really cool story. And again, just a great example of what you might find in these uh, UK newspapers that you're not really going to find in the local papers in, in most cases, right? Of course, um, all sorts of things made the news. So um, I took a look at the war bride situation in UK newspapers and found a couple of examples. This one from 1949, um, the, the individual was you know, married as a war bride and shipped out to Canada um, and she comes back for a visit and she actually stays um, in, the, in her hometown for six months on this visit. And I, I noted that of course they started with what she was wearing, right? Wearing a gay plaid skirt and a pretty pastel pink twin set. Um, she comes over from Canada and she's talking about um, her experience going shopping in the town and saying that nothing has changed. The one thing that, that they have in, this, in her hometown that she doesn't yet have in Canada is television. And I love the quote, kind of to the far right of your screen. I can see that you are preparing to go in for television and that's where you beat us, she says. We are terribly interested, but we haven't gotten television yet. Um, so a, a great example of comparing, you know, her, her hometown to her current uh, town uh, where she's currently residing with her, her husband as a war bride. And then this, another war bride example from 1948. In this case, it's a World War I war bride who comes back um, after being away for 24 years because her, her father was ill and she um, talks about visiting places that she'd never been before and touring the town and saying, you know, it basically just like I remember it, right? Um, so some really cool living history examples of um, our recent ancestors, right? Maybe grandparents for some of us or parents um, actually visiting their hometown um, back in the origin country. So some really, really unique uh, um, aspects of research in this. Okay, let's talk about social history for a minute. Um, we all love our social history, right? So one great example comes from the Illustrated Sporting and Dramatic News. There's a full spread from 1943 about how American women are picking up and, and working the land and working the farms while um, fathers and husbands and brothers are away at war or enlisting. Um, so that's a great kind of full spread, full page spread. But we find all sorts of little tidbits. Now, I have to admit, this is the one search that I did that I really, really was convinced that nothing was going to come up. So I actually did a search um, in the British Newspaper Archive collection for my hometown. Now, I grew up in a very small little tiny town in um, Western Washington, just south of Seattle, and it has a very funny name, Enumclaw. There's only one Enumclaw in the world, I promise that. Um, so I just searched for the name of my town, Enumclaw, and I was actually shocked to find this article. So they're actually talking about um, how the town itself um, had, you know, had this major fire in 1902, and um, most of the citizens were able to get on this train, a Northern Pacific train, and 
and race eastwards for seven miles through blazing forests, trying to beat the fire, right? The passengers were nearly suffocated. Many of the women fainted and the fire continues. Now, I have been working on my family history since I was like 10 or 11 years old. And I have heard lots and lots of stories about the town where I grew up and neighboring communities. I had never heard this story before. And so I went to my family and I said, hey, has any, is anybody familiar with this 1902 fire and this train and, and, and saving the people? And this has lighted up my family history memories. My dad and I have now talked about this several times, trying to figure out if we have any kind of connection or, or relation to this event. Um, and it's just been fascinating, the, the conversations that this one little article has, has sparked. So even in the most obscure cases, right? My little tiny town where there are more cows than people, or at least there were when I was growing up, um, you know, even gets a mention in this, you know, kind of, to me, obscure newspaper on, in the UK, right? So fascinating little piece of, of my own personal history. Now, in terms of immigration, right, there's a whole lot of ways that we can approach this, right? Most of us, when we talk about immigration, we're looking for a passenger list or some kind of evidence that they traveled. Um, in the newspapers, what I actually prefer to look for is information about the process. I want to know about the vessel. I want to know about the, sh the company that they worked with, right? What, what passenger shipping line did they actually sail with? And, and what was that company doing um, in that area? How were they, you know, were they running a good business? Was it, were they advertising in where I think my ancestors might have came from? Is that why they chose to use that shipping line, et cetera, et cetera? What were the policies, right? So in this case, um, 1910 from Lloyd's List, we're looking at an order from the Canadian Immigration Department that required immigrants to possess a certain amount of, of cash, um, or they would be, you know, essentially sent back. Um, uh, so we can look at all sorts of contacts. The Morning Advertiser from 1836 talking about immigration to Canada and the British American Land Company is, is offering a million acres of land, right? Think about the context, right? Our ancestors sitting at home, maybe getting a newspaper and suddenly seeing this offer for acres and acres and acres of land, more acreage than they could possibly even imagine, right? And and thinking, man, you know, maybe I should be going to Canada. Maybe I should be looking at immigration. Maybe I should be getting on a boat, saving my money for a ticket. Um, and and the, the process, the thought process that that started. Um, and then even earlier, right? If we take even one more step back in time, this one from June of 1733, a ship of London from Rotterdam passed by Dover last Monday with 150 immigrants from Salzburg to settle in Pennsylvania in a new colony next to that of the Swiss, which begins by their uh, industry to be very considerable. Wow, 1733. This is literally the start of a town in Pennsylvania right here on this boat. And here it is being listed in the newspapers, right? Pretty, pretty incredible for those of us who... Um, are used to our history in North America starting kind of, you know, maybe 1620-ish or so with the Mayflower, right? Um, it, it think about, you know, the early, early stages of our country and, and how our communities were built. This is it right here in the newspaper. It's pretty cool. All right. And one more example on immigration, again, from my own family history. This is my Irish family, actually. Um, so my ancestor, Daniel McNamara, sail, sailed on the universe. Um, he left in that, that top snippet on the screen. He left the, um, the 10th of November, um, 1863, and settled and uh, headed for New York. Um, and, and then in using American newspapers, I can actually find when he arrived in New York. So that's that bottom segment. He arrives, um, uh, they, again, they left Liverpool November 10th. They arrived on the 28th of December. So it was an 18 day voyage from start to finish. And I know all these details about his actual journey, right? He's not mentioned in any of these, but I know that when he left there, there was a wind to the Northeast and a fresh breeze when they left Liverpool. I know that when they got to New York, they had four deaths and one birth on the vessel. Um, so to me, that is the immigration story that I am going to use newspapers to tell, right? This is, this is literally the, the journey of my ancestor right here. It's these 28 days, or excuse me, 18 days, and what happened in those 18 days. 
There are, of course, the ability to, to research those family legends, the stories, the skeletons in your closet, right? And so some of these things you may want to dig into and some of them you, you may not. Um, the article uh, on the screen is, is the long lost father and uncle from America. It's basically um, uh, being played out in court. And so it's witness testimony to this man trying to scam his family in Ireland. Um, about he's, you know, he's their long lost father from America. And they you know, if you give me your money, um, I will take you to America. And then he just kind of disappears, but they find him and then they, they go to trial. Um, there's also some, I mean, there's just some really extraordinary story stories, right, in these newspapers. So this one I'm going to talk about for a couple of minutes. This is my last example for today. Uh, this is from the Dundee Evening Telegraph from November of 1936. And it is, um, uh, a reporter essentially interviewing this woman, Kate Anton Rattray, who's a, uh, Rattray, a resident of Dundee, um, where Find My Past actually has an office. So I've been to Dundee. So this is one of the reasons I like this story because it's familiar territory, right? So she talks about how she married this man, Alexander, on the 2nd of June, 1905. The very next day, he gets on a boat and he leaves for Canada. The next day, short honeymoon. She writes, they have, they have some letters that go back and forth. Um, and um, she receives the last letter on the 23rd of December, 1905. So um, not just, you know, just six months or so after the wedding. In July of 1934, right? So what, 30 years later, this American company seeks her out and says, your husband had a life insurance policy. The problem is um, there is a second claim filed against that life insurance policy by his wife in Canada. Oh, oopsie. Um, so this second wife filed a claim against this policy. He apparent, according to the policy, to the claim, he married that second wife in 1909, four years after her wedding, and then deserted her in 1922 in Canada. And I thought, what are the odds, right? Like how much of this can we verify um, using our genealogical research skills, right? So you, um, so you read an article like this and then you go, okay, what, what can I do? What can I prove? Well, I went to the passenger list leaving the UK records at first, 1890 to 1960. It's available on Find My Past. And I actually found Alexander. He did, in fact, leave the day after he married uh, Kate. He sailed on the Corinthian, departed Glasgow, headed for Quebec. And he indicated that his final destination was Niagara Falls, Ontario at the age of 24. And he listed himself as single, right? So, all right. Okay, so we know that, that that first step, right, is true, right? He did, in fact, leave the day after he got married. I then move into the Canadian census, which is also available on, on Find My Pass. Um, and I find him, Alexander, with his new wife, Margaret, um, and their daughter, Annie. <laughs> oh, my. Um, and it is, so this is the 1911 census. Um, he's listed as being from Scotland, has a, a year in which he came over 1904, just to the far right of the screen, um, which matches the story. Um, and this is in the St. Catharines kind of sub-district. Um, and that is kind of the general area of Niagara Falls. So that's kind of, you know, it, it plays with the story, right? So far we're doing okay. I then find um, a handful of records, actually, I'm not going to show them all to you, but he passed the um, U.S. Canadian border a couple of times. Um, and so we have him listed in these border crossing records. Um, and so this one from June of 1914, he's headed to Niagara Falls, New York, just on the other side of the Canadian border. And he actually says that his intent is to move there permanently um, and that his wife is Maggie um, or Margaret. Um, and it gives a residence of St. Catharines, Ontario. So that's, that all jives, right. That all works together. Um, and, and then again, we find another one for October of 1920, a couple years later, again, the United States Canadian border crossing records. And this time he says he's moving to Jacksonville, Florida. And again, he's going permanently. Now I have, I have more on this particular family um, because I found it to be very interesting and I couldn't kind of put it down, but all of it jives, right? All of it says that he came across on the Corinthian. He's Scottish. You know, he married this woman, Margaret or Maggie. Um, and so, so the, the story continues, right? But just to show that we can take a newspaper article like that and we can delve into it with kind of these more traditional records and actually say, yeah, a lot of the story that she's presented so far, the original first wife presented, um, is actually, you know, showing to be accurate, right? So kind of an exciting story and, and a fun way to do your research. 
It's important, especially for those of us in North America, to really learn the language. Um, and it's not just the act of actually finding the article, right? It's interpreting the article as well. So I'm going to showcase this by using an example, right? I do a lot of Revolutionary War period um, reading and research, and, and I like that area, right? It's interesting to me. Um, and I read somewhere that the term patriot that we use in America in one way was used in a very different way in the British Isles during this time frame. So I went to British newspapers to actually see if I could figure out you know, if that was true and kind of verify that for myself. So I find several examples, including the one on the screen, an extract of a letter from Virginia dated June 12th, um, brought by the Patriot captain um, it has arrived in Bristol, right? And so they're using the term Patriot as someone who is loyal to, um, to the British crown, right? And, and so that's one interpretation of this term, right? And we need to learn how to use these words and how they were used in context in the time period in question to help us understand and apply the newspaper article to our historical research. So it's, it's interpretation as much as it is kind of understanding the, the lingo of the day, right? So let's take a couple more examples. Um, in this article, um, same time period, right? Revolutionary War time period. It is whispered that some letters of great importance and bad tendency, which were written in the spring to the friends of a certain patriot in America, have been intercepted and are intended to serve as a matter effect effectively to put this, put an end to his popularity. So in this context, right, we can interpret that patriot is not necessarily a compliment, right? <laughs> um, and then again, um, they're talking in this article talking about um, speeches um, in September of 1765, um, his patriotic speeches in parliament in favor of the colonies, their rights and privileges. So here is someone coming to England and, and, and giving speeches and debating in parliament and actually using that as a platform for patriotic speeches for rights and privileges of the colonies, right? So a, yet another um, way to interpret that term, that word pa of patriot or patriotic. So just a quick example of understanding how things were interpreted during the time frame in which the newspaper was printed. So just to, to wrap up, a couple of best practices. Um, search through a variety of names and spellings and everything else, just like you would with newspapers that were local to your, your community. Be willing to search through newspapers from a broad area around your center point, right? Don't just look at Birmingham, England, look at kind of everything for the county or the region and ensure that you're interpreting your findings and, and applying the information in an appropriate way, not just saving the article and adding it to your files or to your tree and moving on, right? Actually take some time with that information, that article, and determine what it really is telling you. A um, couple others utilize various search techniques to identify the newspapers of interest. So use that regional search on the BNA um, to help you find the newspapers of interest, especially if you're unfamiliar with the area. Utilize the Find My Past search and the BNA search in tandem to identify articles for the best results. And of course, take advantage of the Find My Past forum right on Facebook. Um, that group is incredibly helpful and love. And it's such a great community. Um, so if you have questions or if something pops up and you're like, yeah, I'm really not sure about this newspaper or what this word might have meant or um, where this town might even be located in the period I'm interested in, um, take advantage of the Find My Past forum because it's really an, an excellent tool to all of us. And of course, you have to be ready for just about anything. Um, again, I was looking for that, that example of the um, Revolutionary War period and the use of words. And I found this little article, this little extract from a letter, um, a private letter from New York in 1765. And they're talking about the Stamp Act and whether, um, whether or not the Stamp Act will be repealed and um, what they can do in the meantime. And so they're saying, um, instead of regular tea from Britain, you can use ground up Indian corn to be substituted in lieu of tea. And that's what people in America were doing to get through the Stamp Act period um, while they were waiting for repeal and kind of um, protesting the Stamp Act. I had never heard of using corn instead of tea. In all of my reading, I was, this was, I was completely surprised in a, you know, in kind of a delighted way. Like this was just a fun little thing to find. I also, um, 
spent a lot of time looking for kind of that early American material. And so I used search words like colonial and colonies. And this was not quite what I was hoping to find, right? Choices, colonial wines um, and their prices. But if you're interested in this kind of thing, or maybe you're related to Robert Miller and son of Ipswich, you know, maybe, maybe this is exactly what you're looking for. It's not quite what I was um, hoping for, but again, just a fun result um, from my newspaper research that um, it just, you know, have fun with it and, and enjoy your time in the newspapers because this is good. This is good research, right? This is good stuff. All right. So we're going to um, stop doing the slideshow. We're going to do some live Q&A. Um, and I know that there's been some questions asked. I'm actually going to stop sharing my screen, I think, if I can figure out, remember how to do that. Um, and we'll take some questions. Um, and um, all right. So I don't think I'm going to actually stop sharing because if I stop sharing, it might actually turn off the live feed and I don't want to do that. So if you have questions, feel free to post them in the, um, in the chat. Uh, and I know that Niall's been tracking. So that's great. So question from Cheryl. I've just tried to locate the Jedberg article, then the Lincolnshire Echo article to no avail. Can you share the link? in the comments. Yes, absolutely. So Cheryl, I will share those um, those links uh, when we're done with the live feed. Be mu I'm very happy to do that. Have fascinating stuff, right? I'm really excited. All right. So Kim says, um, newspapers give great insight into ancestors' lives and the events at that time. In the East London Observer, question mark, in 1910, it named my great-grandfather and his girlfriend and listed information that I would have never found otherwise. Um, the article is listed under alleged theft. Yeah, that's that's a fantastic example, Kim. Um, thank you for sharing that with us. Uh, it's absolutely just amazing, right, what you can find. Um, really, really interesting. Okay, William says, Jen, are you aware of any passenger lists anywhere for those traveling on military ships? Uh, I have relatives who we know go abroad for work, but they are not always on the passenger list. So I presume they are on the military ships instead of the commercial ships. Um, so William, the only ones I've ever actually seen are uh, during an actual engagement, right? During actual war. Um, so I have seen them, um, but I think that they're relatively rare. That's been my experience. Um, I have not ever seen one during any kind of military downtime, right? Unless um, the only time I've, again, the, just to try and say this in a more clear way, the only time I've ever seen them is when the country in question is actually engaged in war somewhere. Um, so I have seen them, but again, rarely um, and only during active, active military presence. Um, military ships instead of commercial ships, I would assume the same thing. Um, I know that I know for North America, right, for the United States military, we did use passenger ships, um, especially during the world wars, um, to move troops back and forth. And even actually during, you know, Vietnam and Korea and more recent periods. Um, but I don't know specifically about, you know, the British Army, for, for example. Um, it's a great question for my colleague, Paul. Um, so we might ask him just to double check. Um, all right. Um, a good suggestion from... Pat, oh, no, oh, nope, just scrolled by me, um, searching for free on a variety of sites. And again, using the sites in tandem, right? Um, if you have the subscription to find my past, then absolutely use that, but take advantage of what you can get for free on the BNA to, to go back and forth. Um, Cheryl asks, how do I access the BNA site? I have worldwide Find My Past membership, but always look at the newspapers on the Find My Past site. So that's, that's a great timing, Cheryl, on your question. Um, it, so if you... So first thing is the two sites are two separate sites, right? There is a British newspaper archive.co.uk website, and then there is findmypast.co.uk or findmypast.com. Um, so you actually have to manually type in the URL British newspaper archive um, or, you know, Google that to get to the home screen for the BNA. Um, and then again, what I usually do is I just have two tabs open or I'll have them open on, cause I have two screens. I can do it BNA over here and find my past over here um, and, and duplicate the search at the same time. So if I'm looking at, you know, the Eris Gazette from, from Birmingham, uh, from England, I might pull up that newspaper on 
both sites um, and look at them side by side because the search kind of functions a little bit differently. And I might find something on BNA that I might have missed on Find My Past or vice versa. Um, so make sure that you're looking at the newspapers on both separate URLs. Um, Linda says, I'm totally lost when it comes to searching the BNA, can never seem to find anything, any tips. My first tip would be to go to our help content on the BNA. Um, the BNA team is actually incredible. They're just such a wonderful group of people and really, really smart. So there's lots of really good help content already out there on how to use the BNA um, and everything from articles to videos to, you know, I know we've done some lectures and some sessions even on Facebook Live about newspaper research um, before me. So take advantage of those resources, Linda, um, to see if that helps you. Um, but my, my tip would be to use the advanced search. Try to, you know, instead of doing the generic search on the homepage, go into the advanced search settings and learn how to use that. Learn how to combine keywords or first name, last name, um, or search for, you know, uh, one of my maiden name is Brown. So I do a lot of advanced search that says search for Oscar Brown, but not the color Brown, right? So it has to be the phrase Oscar Brown um, to pull a result back versus just any time the word Brown is used in an article. Understanding those advanced search tips is, is probably um, one of your best investments in time in terms of your genealogy education, because that will go far on any website, right? You can apply those learnings to the BNA to find my past to all the, you know, all the other fam family history websites that we all know and love. Um, so take advantage of those, those um, learning opportunities and that, that help content to really refine your search strategy. Um, and Niall just posted, thanks Niall, tips for exploring the British newspaper archive. Um, uh, so that's a great link to use. Start with that, but again, apply that technique, those those skills, to um, to a variety of sites across your research and and your search strategy. Um, okay, let's see if we have other questions coming through. I'm just going to scroll for a second. Um, oh, and Niall just posted the advanced link search as well. So that's fantastic. Thank you, Niall. Um, see if I can see a couple of more. Really appreciate all of you being with us. Um, it's such a fascinating area of research, and I hope that my examples kind of got some people excited and thinking about what you can do. And of course, the strategies that I shared, I mean, I talked specifically about searching from North America and searching in British and Irish newspapers, but the advance, you know, the opposite is true too, right? If you're sitting in the UK and you have ancestors or collateral family members that went to North America, uh, you can absolutely reverse the process and, and utilize our US newspaper collection in the exact same way, right? Um, if you have a full subscription on Find My Pass, you have access to our US newspapers. Um, and, and you can, you know, at, uh, certainly apply it, right? From a, from a UK perspective, you probably, instead of by region, you probably wanna search by state um, to start and then narrow your search results down as you go. Um, but, you know, looking for keywords, major historical events, um, you know, weather situations, you know, all of those things that we talked about already, um, you can apply that to our U.S. newspaper collection um, and take advantage of those materials, you know, from, from the other direction. All right. Niall is saying there's not many other questions, so we'll go ahead and, and call it. Um, thank you all very much again for being with us and watching this morning. Um, oh, Shirley says, how do you access U.S. newspapers? Um, again, Shirley, if you have a full Find My Pass subscription, um, uh, no matter what platform you're on, whether it's .com or .co.uk, you can go to the newspaper section of the Find My Pass website, um, and you just click on U.S. and World. It, there's a little radial button. Um, and that will get you into the United States newspaper collection. It also has newspapers from other parts of the world, but it's primarily U.S. Um, there are also a handful of Canadian newspapers um, available on the British Newspaper Archive, as well as a couple from the Caribbean. Um, and that's a growing part of our collection. We're just starting to kind of get into the Commonwealth areas on the BNA. So that's an opportunity for research um, it, that will be expanding. Are the collections the same? Maureen wants to know. The British and Irish newspapers um, are the same on both sites. So the British Newspaper Archive, all the papers that you get on that site, you also get on Find My Past. The U.S. newspapers, however, are only available on Find My Past. They are not on the BNA. 
Um, so British and Irish newspapers, UK newspapers, absolutely on both sites, US newspapers only on Find My Past. Um, so I hope that answers those last couple technical questions um, that we got through. And it looks like um, Niall saying we don't really have much more. So again, thank you all very much for joining us. Um, wherever you are in the world, we're, we're happy to have you with us. We're really excited to have you explore the Find My Past forum and join the community, join the conversation. Um, please contribute what you know, because that community gets better and better every time someone makes a comment. Um, so for the rest of the week, tomorrow, Wednesday, um, at four o'clock mountain time, uh, I'm sorry, two o'clock mountain time, four o'clock Eastern, and that's nine o'clock UK time, um, we have the first live panel. It's a ask us anything. Um, and it'll be myself, Nico Cleland and Brian Donovan. So we have an American expert, an uh, English expert and an Irish expert all on the same live stream. You can ask us anything you want. If you ask us something unrelated to genealogy, we'll tell you to go back on task and go back to your research. Um, but we're really excited. The three of us um, really enjoy swapping stories and research strategies together. And we're really looking forward to tomorrow's session. So please join us tomorrow. I know it's a little late UK time, but um, um, it will absolutely be a, just a great hour. I think it's going to be a lot of fun. Um, and then we have our Find My Past Friday on live and another session on Thursday. Um, so we have just a really fun filled week of sessions here on Facebook. So please join us. Um, I think that that panel tomorrow will be a, a really del a delight. So thank you all again. We're going to turn it off for the day. And um, we hope all of you are safe and healthy and home. And uh, we're thinking of you and, and hope that you'll share your stories and your research with us at the Find My Past family. So thanks and have a great day.